Um, all of the other speakers today will speak with great wisdom about many specifics on philanthropy, impact investment, corporate responsibility, social innovations, digital platforms, gender equity, and much more. So I thought I'd like to provide a kind of meta framework about what I call connectedness. Um, because I believe connectedness is at the core of all of those different issues, and in fact, at the core of everything. And I'm not just talking about the hyper-connectedness we now have with all our devices. I'm talking about a deeper connectedness that we've always shared with each other. So I'd like you to begin by turning to someone near you who you don't already know. And I'm going to ask you each to take one minute to introduce yourself to each other. I'll give you the one minute mark and then the two minute mark. So total two minutes. So pick someone you don't know, turn to them, and go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> Amelia, you can scan the audience. OK, that's one minute switch. If you haven't already switched, introduce the other. Okay, your two minutes are up. Come back, come back. Come back. <laughs> come on back. <laughs> now, I'd like to know how many of you basically shared your name, where you're from, and what kind of work you do. Yeah, pretty much everyone. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of like the military code of honor for captured prisoners of war. Just give your name, rank, and serial number. That's it, right? You've just revealed the absolute minimal amount of information about yourself possible. So now, close your eyes, think about and feel what's going on inside. In this moment, what's really most important to you? What brings you the greatest joy? What makes you the most sad? What excites you, intrigues you, infuriates you? Take a deep breath, reflect, and open your eyes again. Now, Staying connected to what you just revealed to yourself, turn back to that same person as if you never met each other before. And we're going to do the same two minute introduction, one minute each. Go ahead.
okay, come back. <laughs> come back. Now, was the quality of that entirely different? Do you feel more present? Do you feel more grounded? Do you feel more in your authenticity? Do you feel like you know the other person a little bit better? What a difference two minutes can make, depending on how you use them. Those two introductions are like the difference between what we call open questions and closed questions. When you ask a closed question, like, can you do that job? The only answer is yes or no. Again, the minimal amount of information. But if instead you ask, what's your intention in doing that job? Or what drives you to do that job? You open the door to an invitation of the possibility of a real interaction where you genuinely learn something deeper about the motivation and the purpose of that other person. Voila, connectedness. It's the same thing with every introduction. Every time you show up, you can do it in a closed way where you put yourself in a nicely wrapped box, neatly tied with a ribbon. We all know how to present ourselves. And you walk away from that introduction with a business card, an intent to network, but really not much more. Okay, so I had you introduce yourself to each other. Now I got to do the same thing because we all have to walk the talk. A talk, yeah, <laughs> walk the talk. So you already know I'm the CEO of Because Global Consulting, an international firm. I'm the senior advisor of Global Citizen Circle, our not-for-profit. Both of them bring together wildly different stakeholders to engage on solving the world's most pressing issues. You might have also heard that I work with world leaders like Nelson Mandela. But what makes me tick? Well, I had a very difficult childhood. I could have been beaten down by it. But I became, as I say, strong in the broken places. I have six grandchildren who are the joy of my life. My husband is 15 years older than me, and he becomes 84 in 10 days. I really want him to outlive me, as I can't imagine life without him. I've always valued family and friendship, and with age I've come to cherish it. I've reached a stage in life where scarcely a week goes by where I don't learn about a friend or a family member being diagnosed with a life-threatening disease or dying. It's not easy to face all of that loss. I worry, and I often manifest that w worry by overworking everything, professionally and personally. I find it very hard to find the off switch. OK, that's just a little bit more. But maybe when you approach me now, it will be different than if you just approach me as the famous keynoter. And it's that little, small, added degree of more full disclosure that opens the door to endless possibilities. Yeah, it's got more risks because we become more vulnerable, but the rewards can be boundless. Showing up with your whole self and trying to learn about the whole self of whoever you interact with is the core of what I call 
connectedness. And I've found that the difference between what I call highly competent senior executives and great leaders is exactly that. Knowing and owning all the parts of themselves, the good, the bad, the ugly. That state of full self-awareness enables them to also see, encourage, respect the fullness of whoever they're interacting with. Again, the good, the bad, the ugly. And because of that, they can create dynamics. They can pull out of people the very best of them because they're fully engaged, they're fully present. We here are a refreshingly diverse group of leaders from multiple sectors, each doing very important work. And I love that the organizers of this symposium have given us a lot of time to interact with each other in between sessions. And I encourage you, when you do that, to try to stay in that state of presence and wholeness and connectedness. Because you could, as you often do at conferences, share a business card simply with the intention, this person or this organization can help me. But you can have a deeper sense of purpose in that simple interaction when you show up with your whole self. Yes, yes, I know, we all already have too many contacts and can barely keep up with them. And you still will encounter some people who will remain simply contacts or acquaintances. But in a more open state, you can truly sense if you might really want to stay engaged with the person you meet, they might be a kindred spirit. You might want to work with them, collaborate on something gorgeous. They could even become a lifelong friend. Now, many relationships, whether in philanthropy, impact investment, digital interactions, or any other sphere of endeavor are what I call largely transactional. We want something from each other, we talk, we negotiate, we make a deal, something positive comes out of it. And there's nothing wrong or bad about that. But there's a more profound way to give and receive that comes from communication that's relational rather than transactional. Dealing with each other based on our humanity and our very purpose, not just our goals. We all know that the many underlying aspects of the causes of the needs we're each trying to address and the solutions for filling those needs have many dimensions. The most enlightened, and I assume all of you are, know that filling a need is never a gift. It's always a partnership. The so-called beneficiary has as much, if not more, to offer to the dynamic than the so-called uh, giver about how to solve problems. And when as true partners, we're really open to and apply the insights of those we seek to support, we, our impact always is far more successful. And I see by the shaking of heads that you know this from experience. So we're wise to collaborate with mutual respect with those we believe we're helping. I also think that those deeper connectedness can help us see past the darkness of our current times and have a stronger commitment to create greater light. 
ancient humans, cave dwellers, in some instances, literally would die of fright at the sight of an eclipse. Having no concept of what it was, imagine how terrifying it was for the sun, which also was a mystery to them, to suddenly disappear. Reduced to a massive black circle surrounded by a narrow ring of fire. It must have felt like the end of the world. Well, today could be called a time of eclipse-level fear, with its stunning, often overwhelming problems. We know them. Divisive populism, human migration, <clears throat> climate change, abject poverty, terrorism, gender and racial inequity, ways in which social media is manipulated to create hatred and violence. Many people all over the world are really freaked out. For myriad reasons, people are not only frightened, they're also angry. They're frustrated, they feel hopeless, helpless, and everything is out of control. Some of you might even feel that way, despite all the wonderful work you do. I know I certainly have my moments like that. But we can challenge that dispiriting depression with unabashed optimism, not because we're Pollyannish, but because we know from experience that what the great Margaret Mead said is true. Never doubt for a moment that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And my friend, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Desmond Tutu echoes that sentiment when he says, do your little bit of good wherever you are. It's all those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. That's who we are here today. People who believe in the ripple effect that every single one of our acts can move mountains. And the more we collaborate with each other, the bigger the mountains we move. I also know that that process of effecting change cannot be compared to the solo sprint or marathon. It's rather a continuous, unified effort of a relay race. We do what we can, then we pass the torch, we spread the light. Sadly, we likely will not see the complete fruition of all the social progress we care about, but we each have a sacred obligation to carry that light forward and do our best to have a significant increase on increasing light in the world. And we only can do what we do because there were people before us who carried the torch. This, I believe the Star Wars franchise, I think I lost a page here. I'm so sorry. One, two. No. Where? No. <laughs> anyway, the Star Wars franchise, I believe, is so wildly popular throughout the world because everyone knows, even if only unconsciously, that they always have a choice to advance either light or darkness and to amplify it. And we choose to light the proverbial candle rather than curse the darkness. I didn't change the world as I believed I fully would when I started my activism in the early 1960s. 
but I have, and I will continue to do my part in the long relay race for a more just, equitable, and peaceful world. And connectedness in every sense has been my guide. Connectedness is not just an assortment of processes. It's a philosophy. It's a way of seeing the world. It's recognizing that we can do now because of others who advance social progress before us, and that others who follow us will do even more good because of what we do now. It's a belief in the power, importance, and results of compassion, unity, empathy, fairness, accepting human differences. It's believing that all human creatures and even the earth, a living thing itself, are truly interconnected in the most fundamental way. Not necessarily in a religious sense, although you may see it that way, and not in some hippy-dippy kumbaya idealism, but in an actual, factual, physical, emotional, and systematic way from our smart devices to our shared DNA. There's a huge growing body of scientific research that supports how inextricably interconnected we actually are. So think about that eclipse and, and that glowing ring of fire. That's what we have to focus on until the moon passes and daylight shines again. And daylight is not just about what we do. It's about who we are within ourselves and with each other, our connectedness. Dr. Martin Luther King said, everyone must decide whether he or she will walk in the creative light of altruism. Life's persistent and most urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And I would add to that, how are you doing it? And in the context of philanthropy, um, a scholar, James Allen Smith, warned that modern grant-seeking processes can be dr as drawn out and as humiliating as anything faced by a poor person pleading for assistance in antiquity. And we know this. So connection in action eliminates that horribly disturbing non-productive power imbalance. As I said earlier, we are not beneficiary and, and, and donor. We are partners. When we view each other that way, we come to the fullness. Mother Teresa said, it's not how much we give, but how much love we put into giving. In the final analysis, connectedness is about love. Loving ourselves, loving each other, and interacting with everyone in that spirit, whatever their status. When we act like that, embodying the South African concept of Ubuntu, mm -hmm. I am a person through my relationship with other persons, we increase our ability to have far more powerful impact in whatever way we each try to improve the world. I believe most of you instinctively act in a state of connectedness, but I urge you to be as conscious as possible about that as often as you can and see where it brings you. See who you may become, starting from the moment we walk out of this session and continuing for as long as you want to have a profoundly deeper journey. Thank you.